Uh, good morning, everyone. My name's Kylie, and we're going to continue um, reading in Philippians. So if you'd like to join me um, in Philippians chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 19 to 30. So Philippians chapter 2, 19 to 30. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because he heard he was ill, because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that you may see him again. You may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honour people like him. Because he almost died for the work of Christ, he risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Thanks very much, Kylie. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Kirk, if I haven't met you before. I'm one of the pastors here and just, uh, yeah, really excited to be again back in Philippians and uh, going through this wonderful book together. So uh, let's pray and ask for God's help to, um, to understand his word. Let's pray together. Yes, Father, thank you for the book of Philippians. It's such an encouragement to us, so, so we, we, we want to say thank you, and we ask that you would speak to us through it and help us to grow in you through it. We, we ask uh, that we would know uh, our Lord Jesus and, um, and, and grow through our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, so this morning uh, I, I want to begin by just uh, asking you to think about leadership. I want to ask you to consider the question, what makes a good leader? Uh, if you were to boil down leadership into just a, a few key character qualities, uh, what would you come up with? Now, if you do a, a quick search of the websites on this, you'll see the typical things that you would expect. Uh, leaders should have courage, they should have resilience, they should have integrity, conviction, uh, and, and so on. But interestingly, there's a fair bit of recognition today uh, that actually also the, the softer character qualities are really important. Uh, things like empathy, things like listening, uh, the ability to work with others, and so on. And so this morning, I want to actually highlight a, a softer character quality of the writer of this book, the Apostle Paul, uh, someone who was incredibly courageous and resilient and who uh, maybe we might look up to as a figure of strength, but here's a quality that perhaps you have or haven't noticed, and that's the quality of affection. Uh, he's an affectionate kind of a person. Uh, even though his, his character is one of great boldness and resilience, yet somehow that doesn't seem to have overwhelmed his love for people at all. Uh, he and as we'll see, his co-workers, Timothy and Epaphroditus, they are affectionate. And in fact, I mean, it's not just a kind of a, a leadership strategy, is it? Because really, it's just an outworking of their Christian character. Okay, if you were with us at the start of this series, do you remember how Paul began the book? Uh, he told us in chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, that uh, these Philippians, they were always on his heart, that he longs for them with all the affection 
of Christ Jesus. And then he goes on, and in verse 9 he says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound still more and more. Uh, See, for Paul, this wasn't a leadership thing. This wasn't a strategy. This was just about living out the Christian life. Uh, This was for everyone abounding in love for others. So this morning, we're going to see this affection in Paul and also Timothy and Epaphroditus. Cool name, right? Epaphroditus. Uh, But we're going to see that in them. And just to say that really in demonstrating this affection, all they are doing this morning is imitating the mindset of our Lord Jesus. Okay, if you cast your eyes back over chapter 2, you'll see that the chapter has been about, in humility, valuing others above yourselves. Not looking out for your own interests, but in your relationships being ready to have the same mindset of our Lord Jesus, who came to serve others. See, it's been about applying what we know through Jesus to our own relationships with others. And so here, as we look at Paul and his friends, we notice a kind of humble affection, which is being modelled as an example of what these Jesus-shaped relationships are meant to look like. So let's talk about humble affection this morning. And we mention four things. Firstly, humble affection is warm and personal. Now here in this passage, what's happening is Paul is telling the Philippians that he's going to send Timothy back to them soon... Uh, But in the meanwhile, their friend Epaphroditus is coming to them. And notice as he talks about the Philippians and Timothy and Epaphroditus, uh, just the warmth of his language. Uh, It's clear, for example, that he loves the Philippians, verse 19. He says that when Timothy gets there and returns with news of them, that will totally cheer him up. He so wants to hear of how they're going. But at the same time, it's, it's going to be hard in the meantime without Timothy because we're told Timothy is like a son to me. In another letter, Timothy is described as a, a true son in the faith. Uh, maybe he was converted through uh, the apostle Paul. But whatever the case, he's like a son to Paul. And Epaphroditus, well, he's like a brother Paul regards him as a co-worker in the gospel and a fellow soldier. Can you feel the sense of camaraderie here? Do you notice the the family language and the way that Paul just gets alongside others with warmth? And even with this, this more vertical relationship, yet he's still so personal. Timothy is my son. There's genuine affection here. And that affection, well, it's an expression of humility, is it not? Looking out for others. Uh, uh, Paul has no delusions of greatness. He's not interested in keeping some professional distance. He draws near to people. Uh, See, as we relate to others, there is something very Christ-like in drawing near. Is there not? Uh, Humility lends itself toward affection, to being approachable, to rejoicing in what is good in others, uh, to a kind of charity of disposition where we're thankful for others and interested in them and where we get alongside and encourage. Humility does that. And so, how affectionate a person are you? Are you the kind of person that, that uses language that is so warm and personal as uh, this? I mean, maybe this language makes you feel a little squeamish, but uh, what would this look like for you? Uh, what would it look like for you to grow in the level of warmth of how you relate with others? 
There's a wonderful affection that is the fruit of Christ-like humility. Affection is warm and personal. That's the first thing here. Now, that may seem straightforward enough, but then what we see next is a little more surprising uh, because what we see secondly is that humble affection is anxious for others. Now, as I say, that seems surprising. Uh, There was a news article during the week that mental health disorders in young Australians have increased by some 47% over the last 15 years. And at the top of that list was anxiety. And so, I mean, surely we're not saying that that's a good thing, and we're not. But still, Paul does actually say some surprising things here that are worth thinking through. Okay, do you notice in verse 28 that Paul says that he's eager for his friend Epaphroditus to return to Philippi so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Okay, Paul here, he's he's actually feeling um, sorrowful or anxious for his friend that he would return safely home and be well received. He's anxious for for him. And interestingly, it's clear that the anxiety here is meant to be taken as a token of his love for him. Uh, if he didn't care about Epaphroditus, he wouldn't be so anxious for him. And so anxiety here, I mean, it's spoken of in a fairly unembarrassed kind of a way. And actually, check out a passage a little earlier. Look at verse 20. There, Paul is actually He's commending Timothy to the Philippians and he's going to, uh, as he's going to send him back to them soon. And this is how he commends him. He says, I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern, or literally the word there is anxiety. I have no one else like Timothy who's going to show a genuine anxiety for your welfare. As I say, the word concern there, it it means anxiety. Okay, it's the same word in the original that's actually used later on in the book, in chapter 4, verse 6, where Paul says, do not be anxious for anything. Interesting, isn't it? In 4, verse 6, Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. But here, Paul's commending Timothy for having, if you like, a godly kind of anxiety for the well-being of others. Okay, you think of Paul himself over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, There, Paul is describing all the things that he has suffered for the name of Christ, being stoned, shipwrecked, beaten, sleepless, cold, hungry, and so on. And he caps that list off, this long list, in this way. He says, and apart from these other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. See, it's the same word as what you have in Philippians 4 verse 6, and what you have here in 2 verse 20, there's no one like Timothy who's going to have a genuine anxiety for your welfare. That's what's going on here. Is there a contradiction here? Uh, Are we being encouraged to fret rather than to trust God? No, the Bible always encourages us to take our worries to the Lord. It's what we will see over in chapter 4. But what we see here is that, I mean, the the initial burden that you feel for someone else's welfare, that initial burden, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, you might respond badly to that by fretting and becoming obsessed and taking all of that on yourself, and that's not good. But... The fact that you initially felt some anxiety for someone else's welfare, well, that's good. See, our worries reveal what we love, don't they? Now, sadly, sometimes our worries reveal that we're too caught up with 
things that perhaps we shouldn't be, whether that's wanting more stuff or recognition or being too much about me. Sometimes our worries reveal what is not so healthy in us. But what is being acknowledged here is that the sense of having a a burden for someone else, being weighed down for their welfare, well, that's not all bad. Uh, That can actually be good. Yes, you still need to take that burden to Christ. But what a good thing uh, that your anxieties have revealed of your affections. See, Timothy had a godly sense of being burdened for the good of others. You know, I think it's helpful to appreciate that uh, the kind of care that we're being encouraged toward here is a care that touches our hearts. It affects us um, so that if another person is hurt, you feel for them. If they're in danger, you're concerned for them. Uh, if, 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 if that kind of thing takes energy, right? Um, but that's the nature of genuine care. It's not dispassionate. Okay, dispassionate care, I mean, it's, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a, a kind of easier, isn't it? Um, we can do a whole lot of good things, greeting people, uh, making them a coffee, bringing them a meal, helping with lawns and so on, and all of those are really good things, but it is actually possible to do all of those kinds of things dispassionately without any kind of a heart connection with others. But actually what we're being encouraged toward here is genuine heart connection, where we so love another that we rejoice with them in their joys and we sorrow with them in their sorrows and we feel with them in their cares. That's the kind of affection that Timothy had. And it's a more demanding affection, but it's also a more genuine one. Humble affection is anxious for others. And in a sense, we see this again now as we look at Epaphroditus, because in our next point, what we see in Epaphroditus is that humble affection invests emotionally. All right, consider the story of Epaphroditus here. Uh, Epaphroditus, it's clear from uh, chapter 4, verse 18, he's come from Philippi with a gift for Paul. Uh, They were supporting Paul financially, and it seems um, Epaphroditus was also there to help look after his needs. But then in Rome, we're told, he gets terribly sick. We don't know what it was. Um, Malaria, not that uncommon, uh, in that area, even we're told bubonic plague around that time. We just don't know what it was, but he almost dies. And it's interesting how he responds to that. Okay, check out verse 26. It says, For he, Epaphroditus, longs for you all and is distressed because you heard that he was ill. And now, isn't that a fascinating comment? What's he distressed by? Um, not so much by the fact that he was almost dead, and I'm sure that distressed him too. Uh, but it was the Philippians uh, that they have heard that he was almost dead. He's thinking, oh, poor Philippians, they're going to be so worried about me, and uh, I mean, they don't even know that I'm starting to feel a little bit better. Poor Philippians. Uh, and that kind of level of emotional investment that Epaphroditus had in the Philippians. Um, When he's sick, he's concerned for the worries that they're experiencing through that. Um, It's an indication of his level of investment in them, isn't it? You know, in verse 30, Paul underlines that Epaphroditus on this mission had risked his life for the cause of Christ. And I think there that Paul is saying that Epaphroditus was like Jesus, who we've seen earlier in the chapter, giving his life for others. Uh, and, And what I want to say here in relation to that is, you know, I mean, you might not be called on to sacrificially risk your life in a foreign country to assist a missionary. Uh, But I reckon that all of us are called on to love people to a point that it even hurts. Uh, I I reckon, in fact, that sometimes you can take, that can take just as much courage, uh, just as much investment to take that kind of a risk as to take some kind of a, a physical 
risk. You know, to give ourselves in genuine love to others, it can feel risky, can't it? Because you can get hurt when you love another. Things can change. People let you down, and it really does take an investment to tie yourself to people. Sometimes that even feels like sacrifice. But actually, it's a wonderful thing as we see in this passage. It's a beautiful thing. It's a joyful thing. And there's something Christ-like in it. And so let's invest in others. You know, our world today has a ton of fairly shallow relationships. It does not um, require much, much investment to friend someone on social media and so on. But, I mean, the truth is that relationships that don't cost much don't end up being worth much, do they? And if you're going to have relationships that matter, relationships that make a difference to others, and a difference for Christ, we must invest in them. Humble affection is willing to invest emotionally. And so now we get to our final point, and the last thing we want to see here this morning is that humble affection is more than sentimentality. Okay, we've spent a bit of time this morning talking about having a genuine care for people and investing from the heart. But at the same time, I do want to acknowledge that um, affection will produce more than just sentiment. It will work itself out in action. Okay, look again at our passage, and I want you to consider Timothy again. Uh, Timothy, we're told in verse 19, will soon be heading to Philippi. And it's clear that this will be a return journey because part of the, the purpose is that Paul will then receive news from him as to how the Philippians are going. And so this is a return journey he's about to head on. And it's just worth saying that that's not a small thing. Um, Rome, as you can see on this map that will come up just now, I mean, Rome is um, way over there to the west in Italy, and then there's uh, Philippi, a fair way over to the east, up the top in the middle of your map in Macedonia, and the return trip from Philippi to, to Ro from Rome to Philippi to Rome is uh, something like 2,600 kilometres. I mean, th that is uh, further than going from Brisbane to Canberra and then back again. And so, I mean, this in that age, it was several weeks of travel. And, and so, yes, the Timothy had a humble affection for the Philippians and Paul, but absolutely, this was working itself out in action. Uh, it wasn't just sentimentality. You think too of Epaphroditus, of course, uh, who, who Paul commends for risking his life for the Philippians. And it's interesting there in verse 25 that Epaphroditus is described not only as a brother and as a, as a co-worker, but also as a fellow soldier, right? I mean, if that's not the language of hardworking action, um, I don't know what he is. And so affection here produces action. It's more than sentimentality. We're ready to make sacrifices, whether that is giving up time or helping with a difficult task or um, doing something that isn't our thing or being there when it's tough or rearranging our plans or helping with a need, a humble affection has a, a sacrificial practical outworking. And of course, as we've already said, that really is just a response to what we know in Christ, isn't it? Timothy, we're told there in verse 21, um, does not look out for his own interests. And really, that's just saying that Timothy has learned to follow his uh, master. Remember earlier in the passage, we've been told in verses 4 and 5 that we can learn uh, not to follow our own interests um, in relationships by seeking to have the same mind as Jesus. Uh, uh, Jesus, we're told, he was one who humbled himself to the point of death. He acted as a sacrifice for our sins. He gave up his interests for our own. And so we follow that lead. 
and we die now to ourselves, living for Christ. And so humble affection will mean more than sentimentality. It will involve sacrificial action. And so as we finish this morning, uh, let's be encouraged to be a genuinely affectionate people. As I've said uh, today, really this kind of affection, it, it shouldn't be seen as surprising in any way, uh, because really it's, it's just imitating the kind of mindset that we've seen in uh, Jesus. Uh, Paul and Epaphroditus uh, this morning and Timothy, uh, they haven't shown us anything new. All they've done is given us further examples of what a humble, Jesus-shaped life looks like. And so as we seek to live out that faith in Christ, let's seek to be warm and personal. We want to invest in others emotionally, even to the extent that sometimes we feel anxious for them. And we want to practically pursue the interests of others following in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus. Let's Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your affection for us in Christ. Uh, thank you for your genuine love for us, uh, uh, that it would even result in sacrificing for us, giving yourself for us. Uh, so may we love others well. Uh, may we have them in our hearts that we might give of ourselves for others. We pray this in Jesus' name.